I like to say today that I've truly been blessed to have Emily as my first PhD student. Uh, she's done a lot of great work as we'll hear shortly. And it's been a pleasure to watch her grow in all of the different aspects of the scientific craft. Uh, today's not a farewell by any means for Emily's actually starting as a postdoc with me this semester, assuming all goes well today. Uh, there are of course many upsides to going somewhere else to do a postdoc as I'm sure we all know. Uh, but I will frankly say that the selfish part of me is very glad that Emily will continue to uh, be working here with us. Okay, Emily, I, I guess at this point, uh, you take it away. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate the kind words and know that I have not regretted uh, choosing to work with you uh, over Steve Pinker uh, once in, in my four years here, so. Okay. Yeah, um, and first let me thank all of you for being here. And uh, of course, especially the members of my committee and my PhD advisors, uh, James Lee and Matt McGue, uh, for all of your support and excellent guidance uh, over the years. Um, I know some of you are attending from different time zones, and I very much appreciate uh, your willingness to accommodate uh, this today. So without further ado, um, let me present the sum of my work here at the University of Minnesota over the past four and a half years, uh, tracing causes and consequences of human intelligence through genetic and cognitive data. So first, I'll provide a brief overview of what this project has involved. Um, this work represents research into three areas of cause and consequence of human intelligence differences. Uh, study one uses molecular genetic data to demonstrate what we call genetic nurture, through which the unique genetics of parents can give rise to passive gene environment correlation that then goes on to affect their offspring's uh, educational attainment. Study two explores the role of general intelligence in the flow of information processing. By partitioning response times into perceptual and decisional stages, intelligence is shown to be expressed uniquely in the decisional but not the perceptual stage. And finally, study three examines the sources of variance in IQ in a fully adult sample of adoptive and biological families. Uh, we find that by age 32, little evidence remains for an effective parenting on the IQ scores of offspring. So in sum, the converging operations afforded by methods such as twin and adoption studies, genomide association, and elementary cognitive tasks can address important questions of causal inference in human intelligence. Now, before I launch into the meat of uh, these three studies, I want to provide a brief introduction to explain how we define intelligence and how looking at it from these different perspectives is important um, as we work towards a sort of coherent understanding of intelligence at multiple levels of analysis. So I'll just start with um, what is intelligence exactly? It certainly involves the ability to solve problems like this example, Raven's progressive matrix uh, on, on the left here. Um, intelligence is uh, well known to be normally distributed almost perfectly in uh, representative populations. And so intelligence is many things, of course, and many um, different opinions of how to define it have been put forth over the years. But my very favorite is the ability to deal with complexity by Linda Gottfriedson. And so any sort of problem in the real world or on paper in a test or out there in nature uh, that involves problem solving and dealing with uh, complexity in basically any of its forms is likely to be related to intelligence. What do IQ tests measure? Well, um, we, we have over a century's worth of research on intelligence and we know that a general factor or a G factor of general intelligence sits at the top. Um, and this reflects this intercorrelation of performance on all types of cognitive problems, such that people who are good at one type of mental task tend to be good at others, regardless of whether that task is vocabulary, uh, processing speed, spatial ability, and so on. And of course, some people are stronger in one domain or other, um, and also in specific abilities there at the bottom. So most of the research I'll be talking about today is concerned with G, the general factor. Here are just a couple of important things that we know about IQ um, from the century of research. 
and all of which are relevant uh, for the research I'll be presenting today. So first, we know that IQ tests are highly reliable instruments, uh, both across time and within tests. And this graph here represents my favorite example of this fact. In 1932, the Scottish government gave every 11-year-old in the entire country attending school that day an IQ test. Uh, that was almost 90,000 children total. And 66 years later, called them back uh, to give them another IQ test. And uh, you can see the correlation. Um, between test scores at time one and time two here uh, represented here. So even 66 years can go by and IQ tests remain uh, reliable. Second, um, IQ tests are also highly predictive for a, a, a very large range of different kinds of individual difference outcomes. We'll be focusing today mostly on educational attainment, but also um, IQ is predictive for things uh, as wide as income, job performance, social mobility, and even things like criminal behavior and health. Uh, this graph here shows um, from, from some of my data, the correlation between the IQ scores of uh, everybody in the sample and their uh, highest, or the quantity of years of education that they have earned by adulthood, a correlation of about 3.36. We also know that IQ is highly heritable. Um, in 1979, Tom Bouchard uh, launched what was at the time the largest and highest powered study of the heritability of intelligence. Uh, he collected a very unique sample of identical or monozygotic twins uh, that had been separated at birth and had grown up in completely different homes and uh, reunited them and tested them on IQ in, in the lab. So these, the IQs of these separated identical twins correlated at about 0.75. And later, the uh, a heritability estimate of G from this sample was generated at about 0.77, which means that about 77% of the variance in general intelligence is associated with genetic variance. And so IQ and its associated constructs are, um, are influenced by a, a huge number, we now know, of genetic variants, each of individually very small effect. And um, we know also that these variants causally affect the development and functioning of the brain and uh, the, the, the mechanics of the synapse. Uh, here we can see a, a graph from Lee et al. 2018 showing that um, the genes associated with years of education are, are greatly overexpressed only in neural tissue and uh, synaptic functioning, but um, not in any other types of tissue or cell. So these may seem like a, a bunch of kind of disconnected facts, but um, they're not. When we're talking about causal inference and the nature of intelligence in terms of what it predicts and what predicts it, uh, Ian Deary's distinction I find particularly useful. So he distinguishes between uh, looking up to and looking down from the intelligence construct. Looking up refers to uh, the examination of the real life impacts of intelligence in terms of life outcomes um, and so on. So um, we would ask questions like, how does variation in IQ causally relate to real world consequences like educational achievement? Um, meanwhile, the looking down perspective refers to our attempt to understand intelligence in its um, reductive uh, uh, foundations. So things like basic information processing in laboratory tasks, and of course, brain structure and function. Um, and of course, the gene products that lead to such. So the focus of my interest in human intelligence is in how we can integrate these levels of analysis in a program of research. Uh, this sort of looking in on human intelligence can allow us to measure and model specific causes and consequences. And so in the following research, I will be asking questions such as these, from looking up what is the nature of the relationship between education and intelligence? Can parental environment uh, influence child achievement? So we use tools such as adoption studies, twin studies, and correlational data to answer questions such as that. And then from looking down, how do the gene products of genetic variants associated with intelligence actually form in the synapse? What do they do? How does intelligence affect the speed of information processing in the laboratory? 
So we use tools such as genome-wide association, polygenic scores, and reaction time uh, tasks in the lab. And so um, study one, we call the role of parental genotype in predicting offspring years of education, evidence for genetic nurture. So to start with some background, um, as most of us here know over the past decade or so, uh, behavior genetics has made uh, tremendous strides towards understanding the actual genetic contributions to things such as IQ and educational attainment. So these studies basically analyze the genomes of a huge, huge samples to look for individual genetic variants that are associated with, ever, with whatever the trait of interest is, uh, in this case, years of education. So in 2013, the first GWAS of um, educational attain attainment was conducted on 100,000 participants and found three uh, significant genetic variants associated. If we triple the sample size, uh, we can find uh, 74 individual variants as predictors of years of education. In 2018, uh, Lee et al. conducted the third um, and at the time largest historically ever GWAS on educational attainment um, of over a million individual participants. And this study identified over 1,200 significant genetic variants that are associated with this complex real life outcome. And so um, for two of these studies I'll be talking about, we use polygenic scores that are constructed from this massive GWAS. So in this first study, um, we're going to be using these polygenic scores as predictors. I'll briefly just describe what these scores actually mean and how we make them. So for each, um, in a GWAS, a, a set of genetic markers is genotyped in a training sample, uh, and then estimates are obtained of each marker's association with whatever the trait of interest is. These weights are then used to uh, construct a score that we call a polygenic score for each individual in a replication sample that's independent from the initial sample. So for EA3, um, the polygenic score constructed from uh, this very large sample explains up to 13% of variance in educational attainment and 10% in uh, IQ or cognitive ability. Uh, we also know that years of education appears to be highly genetically correlated with cognitive ability and math ability. And, um, and, and, and thus is a useful proxy for IQ. And it's uh, especially useful because it's much easier to generate a huge sample that has data on how many years of education they've completed than it is to generate a sample with that many uh, IQ scores. So um, in this equation here, simply the estimated PGS or S hat of an individual uh, is equal to the weighted sum of the individual's marker genotypes, X at M SNPs or genetic variants over the weights of beta hat. So um, the research question, the, ma the main research question I'm asking in the first study here is since genetic variants are shared between parents and biological offspring, uh, they can often confound causal inference for offspring outcomes if we're trying to understand what elements of the environment uh, might, might or might not be playing a role. So um, we can use both parent and offspring polygenic scores to test for the presence of parental influence uh, that therefore controls for the shared variants um, across generations. So if parents are able to have an, inf an impact on the environment of their uh, children, leading to a, a change in that child's educational attainment, then we would expect to see that the parent's polygenic score should significantly improve the prediction um, of offspring, educa uh, offspring educational attainment above and beyond the offspring's own polygenic score, therefore controlling for the shared genetic variance. So we call this effect when it appears genetic nurture. And so if genetic nurture is operating, uh, we would also predict that the predictive power of the polygenic score should decline when it is applied within families. I'll explain what that means in more detail uh, in a moment. So if we do detect genetic nurture in this kind of design, uh, we can ask what mechanisms might this be operating through? 
So we can, um, we can test for, for things, uh, parental traits that might involve their changes to the environment, such as uh, IQ, education, and especially the socioeconomic status of the family. So um, we use this educational attainment PGS to, to do this prediction in a sample of uh, about 2,500 twins and their parents, um, parents of twins. So this is this sample comprises uh, over 4,000 uh, individuals, all of European ancestry, um, parents and offspring from over 1,200 individual families, which includes about 2,000 parents, almost equal numbers of mothers and fathers, and um, almost 2,500 total twins. And uh, 830 of these um, are dizygotic or fraternal non-identical twins and about 1,600 are uh, identical or monozygotic twins. And so when we use um, parental characteristics as predictors, including the polygenic score, we will be referring to the mid-parent value, that is the mean of the mother and father value. The phenotypes that we looked at in the study include, of course, the total years of education uh, for the offspring, or the, uh, for the parents, the educational level, which is basically just the uh, highest degree earned by the parent. High school GPA of the offspring collected at age 17. And IQ scores, uh, Wexler uh, children or adult version, depending on age of the participant. Um, and a family socioeconomic status composite. And this includes family income, uh, the education level of the parents, and the parents' occupational status on the Hollingshead scale. And then finally, um, a soft skills composite. And this, uh, this composite is made of conscientiousness, capacity to be hardworking, and self-control. And then the polygenic scores are calculated from EA3 uh, data using LDPRED. And the, uh, the data from uh, the sample was removed from the GWAS before weights were derived. Okay, so uh, this study is represented by three primary findings. First, um, individual predictions of this PGS on all outcomes uh, are significant with about 9% of the variance in years of education explained, uh, over 8% in IQ, 7% GPA, and nearly 3% in soft skills, which uh, that's all to be expected. Um, but we also find that within each dizygotic twinship, that is uh, fraternal twins who are no more genetically similar than any regular pair of siblings, um, but they are the same age, and they're usually studied in same-sex pairs. So they are genetically different, um, but they share all of the same uh, family environment, usually the same school and so on. So we find that within these twinships, the twin with the higher polygenic score is significantly more likely to also have higher GPA, more years of education, and a higher IQ. So this basically just means that um, when you're, you're controlling for the family environment between siblings, if, they, if the twin with the higher uh, value of X also has the higher value of Y, then there is a, a genetic effect uh, clearly operating. Um, however, it's important to note that the within twinship prediction is substantially smaller for the, uh, than, than for the individual prediction for both years of education and IQ. So um, a within sibling analysis is extremely important in these kind of uh, studies of causal inference. So they ask across many pairs of siblings, does the sibling with a higher value of X also have the higher value of Y? And so since siblings who grew up together and share the same parents, the same SDS, the same uh, place of residence, uh, usually the same school, um, this kind of design controls for all of those factors of the familial environment. So in this case, the smaller but significant within family relationship between polygenic scores and educational attainment suggests that both genes and the family environment are probably uh, contributing to education. So our second major finding and the, uh, the center of the study pretty much 
is that uh, we find that the mid-parent polygenic score does indeed add a significant 1.8% of incremental variance. In addition, uh, above and beyond the offspring's own polygenic score in predicting the offspring's educational attainment. And so we can see here um, the, the change in R square of the parental polygenic score. Uh, it, it is kind of teetering on the edge of significance for some of these other phenotypes as well. But it's clear that for the years of education, it is uh, much larger and uh, much more reliable. So um, why you might be wondering, why do we include height and BMI here? And before I explain that, just notice that the R squared for the uh, parental polygenic score for height and BMI are both extremely close to zero and not even close to being significant. So here's basically a recasting of the same data in a more visually uh, appealing format. And here we can compare the magnitude of the slopes for offspring polygenic score alone, um, the dark green bar, and in a multiple regression along with parent polygenic score um, and the size of the mid-parent uh, polygenic score slope in this multivariate model. So the light green bar for each cluster of outcome traits represents basically the size of genetic nurture. So um, we include polygenic scores in their accompanying phenotypes for two non-behavioral traits, body mass index and height, um, as, as negative controls, basically. So while it is intuitively plausible that parents um, can influence something like the years of education through the environment, it is much more difficult to explain why such an effect would occur for something like height. You know, it would basically be saying that a parent's polygenic score for height is causally changing something about the offspring's environment that then goes on to causally influence the offspring's actual attained height. So by using these negative controls, we can dispense with uh, the possibility that these genetic nurture effects are just kind of an artifact of the specific polygenic score or some kind of measurement issue with the phenotype and, and so on. So now that we have evidence for a, a, a fairly strong effect of genetic nurture for years of education um, brings us to our third major finding for this study. Um, we can add different parental covariates to the multivariate model to see if, um, if doing so attenuates or eliminates the predictive value of the parent's polygenic score on the offspring's years of education. And so what we see here is that um, if we add IQ and especially socioeconomic status into the model, then uh, the parents, the unique contribution of the parents' polygenic score declines um, and then is basically eliminated. Um, if we do the same for heights and BMI, we see basically no change at all, as would be expected if, in fact, parents are causally influencing the years of education of their children uh, through the environment. So, um, those three findings in summary basically support the presence of genetic nurture uh, in the sample. Um, so we find, just to overview quickly, uh, within families, the dizygotic twin with a higher polygenic score is more likely to attain higher education, but that this effect is weaker within families than it is between them. Second, we find an effect of the parent's uh, genotype on the offspring's outcome, uh, years of education, that is in fact independent of the offspring's own genotype, raising the total explained variance to just over 11%. And so when we control for parental IQ and SES, uh, the effect of parental genotype basically disappears. So um, in sum, these findings together suggest the role of the environment uh, that's affected by heritable characteristics of the parents in fostering offspring years of education. And so why are findings such, of these, such as these uh, important? It might seem like 1.8% of significant variance is, is just vanishingly small, but it's actually, um, 
I would say it's fairly large in terms of what we would, would typically expect to find for an effect of the family environment in a genetically sensitive study. Um, so, you know, findings such as these, they help us understand the nature of this um, kind of molecular version of passive gene environment correlation, but they also um, might be able to allow us to actually, you know, draw specific conclusions about what we can do uh, to raise the, uh, the chances that, you know, offspring will, uh, will become more educated if, if that's what we desire. And then, you know, ultimately leading to better learning environments for children or more informed policy, uh, especially educational policy and so on. Um, and ultimately a more educated society. All right, so that's uh, study one has been published in molecular psychiatry uh, as of last year, and the supplementary material is available on uh, Dr. Lee's website. Okay, um, so next I'll be changing uh, changing gears quite a bit and talk about uh, parsing information flow in speeded cognitive tasks, the role of G in perception and decision time. So to overview the context of this study, um, we know from quite a lot of research over the years that processing speed on extremely simple laboratory tasks of reaction time uh, correlates substantially with IQ in the range of uh, minus 0.2 to minus 0.4, which basically means that um, more intelligent people tend to be faster in responding to even extremely simple um, tasks like uh, you know, press this button as quickly as you can when you see the light appear on the screen and whatnot. Um, so we know that faster people tend to be smarter. We also know that um, G apparently interacts non-additively with manipulations that, that, that change the average difficulty of a task. So basically, um, if, we, if we increase the difficulty of some basic reaction time task, then you know, the, the difficulty increase slows all participants down, but it slows higher IQ individuals down less. This is relevant to the real world um, because uh, findings such as these lead to the conclusions that um, higher IQ can, can produce a, a larger benefit in things like rapid multitasking when the tasks are more complex. So this has implications, um, possible utility for things like um, pilots learning uh, how to fly or military training and, and many other things. So um, I'm interested in figuring out what is happening during a single reaction time trial. You see a stimulus, you make a decision, you press a button. Um, so if we break this process down into stages and think about each stage separately, well, first uh, is the perceptual stage, of course. Uh, you perceive the stimulus that appears on the screen, the photons uh, hit, hit the back of your retina and, the, uh, and are encoded and sent down the optic nerve uh, to the back of the brain for processing. And then um, something happens in which you have to decide what the informational content of that stimulus actually is. And in doing so, make a decision about reacting one way or another. Um, and then once that decision has been generated, um, the, the signal to, to make a motor response is then uh, sent and the trial is completed. So, um, so this, this portion of my research is, is asking this kind of simple question, are these processes equally dependent on intelligence or is intelligence more intimately related to one or more portions of this process? So uh, James Lee and Chris Chabri looked at this question in detail in a 2013 paper that inspired the current study. Um, they administered a speeded number comparison task to a higher and lower uh, IQ group of groups of students um, and asked them to respond to two numerical stimuli that were shown uh, quickly in sequence one directly following the other. So basically what they found is that um, participants are able to process the perceptual qualities of the two numerals somewhat in parallel, but that the central decision uh, segments where the, the person had to evaluate the quantity of the numeral 
um, that this had to be carried out serially, that it was not possible for these processes to be conducted for each numeral at the same time. So um, in, in addition to this, it seemed as though the higher IQ subjects were comparatively less slowed down in this serial processing component, uh, which suggests that it is in this serial bottleneck of central processing where the higher IQ advantage in reaction time actually exists. But to really clarify whether the advantage of IQ is only in the central processing bottleneck, uh, we would actually need to see a simultaneous absence of an interaction between G and some experimental manipulation. So um, by using the method of additive factors, we can show that response time is composed of at least two stages, only one of which we hypothesize um, is executed more rapidly by higher IQ subjects. So uh, again, this first stage would be the sensory input, basic perceptual processing, encoding, so on. And then the second stage is the evaluation of uh, the semantic content of that stimulus, <clears throat> such as the magnitude of a numeral. And so we can also uh, use a technique called diffusion modeling to kind of recast these stages uh, along a, a different um, but, but very complementary uh, light a non-decision residual stage and a stochastic diffusion stage. And this is where the decision would be generated. So during the process of diffusion, neurons respond to a stimulus by firing um, in aggregate. And um, you know some of them are going to be firing a, a little bit wrongly and some of them, um, more of them will be firing more accurately, but the process of that happening is basically accumulating enough evidence to trigger a decision. And when the decision is triggered, uh, thus the, the trial is terminated. And so um, it has been shown that the, the relationship between reaction time and intelligence is specifically a correlation of IQ with the rate of this evidence accumulation process, rather than with the non-decision residual time. So, According to the diffusion model, um, a reaction time in one trial is the sum of two components. There is a non-decision uh, non component represented here in this illustration by E and R, and then a stochastic decision component represented here by the central block D. So if we increase the difficulty level of the perceptual or motor components, then the slowdown in reaction time would be in the E and R stages. And if we uh, increase the difficulty of the decision component, then the resultant slowing of reaction time would be in the D or decision generation stage. And so a single trial is the sum of these three stages. So in this study, um, we examine the hypothesis if the perceptual stage of response time is fundamentally unrelated to G, but the central decision stage is, then IQ should not show an interaction with a perceptual manipulation, but it should simultaneously show an interaction with a decision manipulation. And uh, this would be further evidenced if we found basically the same effect in a task that is very similar conceptually, but does not rely on the same sensory modality. And it should also be reflected in a correlation between IQ and the drift rate diffusion parameter, but not in the non-decision parameter. So um, the measures that we used in this study, in addition to an IQ test, in this case, the ICAR-16, we administered two reaction time tasks to each participant. And in each task, we manipulated a perceptual and a decisional component. So for the number comparison task, um, the participant is asked to rapidly judge whether a numeral is larger or smaller in quantity than a target numeral. This is um, basically the same, the same task used by uh, Lee and Chabri in 2013. Uh, they must rapidly and accurately decide the quantity of the numeral. And even though this seems like an extremely simple task, it turns out that um, very reliably participants are um, much faster at making that determination when, when the stimulus number is further away from the target digit. So that is um, P 
people respond across the board more slowly to deciding that four is smaller than five than they do to deciding that one is smaller than five. Now for the perceptual manipulation, we can vary the, con the visual contrast of the numeral uh, against the background, there thereby making certain uh, versions of the number more difficult to see. So in addition to this, um, we constructed a, a tone comparison task that is conceptually similar, but instead of a numeral, the person has to rapidly judge whether the frequency of a tone is higher or lower than a target. Uh, and then as such, the perceptual component is manipulated uh, simply by varying the loudness of the tone, making some of them uh, more quiet and difficult to hear. And so um, this is basically what, what a participant would see when they see this task. Uh, they stare at the box until the digit appears, and then they very rapidly try to hit the correct button, whether the number is less or greater than five. As you can see, sometimes the number is going to uh, be harder to see. It's going to be light gray in some cases, which also should produce a measurable slowdown in reaction time. Okay, so our sample consisted of uh, 768 total participants across all three of these tasks. Uh, all of the participants were um, pretty young as research indicates that reaction speed uh, tends to slow down rapidly uh, in the early 20s. All were recruited from the undergraduate psychology pool, so um, female participants are substantially overrepresented. And just some uh, sample uh, statistics for, from our, our IQ test here. Even though it was uh, extremely uh, nicely normal, it definitely has, has a ceiling effect where uh, it's only really able to measure IQs accurately up to maybe 135 or 140. But um, nevertheless, a pretty, pretty nice smooth curve there. So first, just to validate the overall reaction time and IQ relationship, um, it is indeed correlated basically right in the middle of the range that um, we see in existing literature. Very strong, nice uh, uh, minus 0.32, just overall mean reaction time, um, regardless of level of difficulty. But now what we're really concerned about are the main effects of distance and contrast, and then uh, later the interactions. So as anticipated, participants were indeed much slower <clears throat> at deciding whether a number was greater or less than five. Um, when the number was one digit away uh, and got it kind of got faster the further out from five. So this means that the, um, the number, the, the digit of the number does adequately reflect a differing level of decisional difficulty. And um, they were also noticeably slower when the stimulus was in the low contrast condition. So instead of con levels of contrast or numerals, I'm just uh, using easy, easiest, easy, hard, and hardest levels here. We can see that the means definitely change across those uh, in the direction you would expect. So the main question of interest is whether IQ scores interacted with reaction time over levels of each type of manipulation. So we used analysis of covariance to test for the presence of an interaction between IQ and RT over levels of distance versus levels of contrast. And um, we can see here, these are the relevant uh, numbers. Um, the F ratios for uh, IQ as, as a, a covariate in uh, over, over levels of distance was definitely significant. And the um, interaction for uh, levels of contrast was definitely not exactly as we should predict. Uh, so this graph on the left here is a kind of useful way to visualize the effect of a continuous covariate across levels of a difficulty manipulation, um, basically through the visual inspection of regression slopes. So um, the implication of a significant interaction between IQ and uh, a distance manipulation in ANCOVA is that the magnitude of the regression coefficient of um, IQ on RT should monotonically increase across levels of distance, right? So that's the blue line here. And we do, we do indeed see that. It could almost not be more perfect than that if I tried. Um, and meanwhile, we, we see no such significant monotonic change for levels of contrast. Even though it looks like it's upticking a little bit, the error bars clearly are uh, overlapping in all cases. So, um, so this is exactly what we would expect. Also true to prediction, the correlation between drift rate or diffusion rate 
and IQ is strong, um, almost the same uh, magnitude as it is for just mean reaction time and IQ overall, while the correlation between non-decision time and IQ is very weak and arguably non-existent, also exactly as we should predict. Uh, next, we calculated individual rates of diffusion for each participant and for each level of each manipulation. And so this number basically represents the rate of evidence accumulation that is needed to reach a decision about the stimulus. Uh, so we see that for contrast, there is basically no change, um, but for over, over the levels of distance, we see a quite substantial change in that uh, diffusion rate over the, over the different levels. And so non-decision time, the right-hand column here, shows basically the opposite pattern. Uh, it changes monotonically over levels of contrast, but um, little regular change is, uh, is evidenced over levels of distance. So just to graph that, this is what we would see here, where distance uh, interact, dist over levels of distance, drift rate um, monotonically increases and over levels of contrast stays almost perfectly flat. And uh, it's not perfectly flat for distance for non-decision time, but it is not a monotonic change as it is for contrast. So again, this is extremely close to what we would predict under our hypothesis. Um, another way to look at this instead of individual diffusion parameters is if we use quintile level parameters, uh, this eliminates the kind of inferential problem um, with some individuals having too few error rates to accurately calculate things like drift rate. Um, so if we look at IQ quintiles, so IQ scores chopped up into five uh, groups, um, we can see that uh, the, the measures of, of drift um, are, are definitely being affected by IQ uh, quintile, whereas the uh, measure of non-decision time uh, represented by T uh, does not seem to vary with IQ at all. So again, um, this quintile level analysis uh, provided very precise and elegant support for a model where G is associated only with a decisional stage and not a perceptual stage. So for the tone task, um, the results were somewhat weaker overall, but the pattern is important. I'm not going to go into detail about the specific numbers here, but uh, in general, we find that the IQRT slope changes monotonically over levels of frequency distance, but remains close to flat over levels of loudness. The error bars are much larger on this one, but nevertheless, the pattern is consistent. Um, the problem with, in, with, with getting into too much inference for this one is that the main effect of loudness was much uh, too weak um, by comparison. So we caution uh, interpretation of the lack of an interaction with loudness as positive evidence against one. Uh, so likewise, uh, diffusion model parameter estimation offers somewhat equivocal support for the main hypothesis. Um, the diffusion rate behaves pretty much exactly as we would hope, where um, drift rate is pretty much unchanged over levels of loudness, but strongly and monotonically increases over levels of distance. But the problem then is for non-decision time, um, the non-decision time shows evidence of it being affected by both distance and loudness to some extent. But nevertheless, our conclusions, um, pretty robustly support our main hypothesis. Um, comparison of results across different levels of difficulty for both decision and perception stages of pro processing uh, indicate that there is a clear pattern that invokes G in only one of those stages. Um, both experiments produce a similar pattern of results across uh, various manipulations. And together, uh, they suggest that the, the location of the G and RT relationship is unique to the stage of central processing, regardless of sense. So why do these questions matter? Seemingly pretty disconnected from studies of genetics and polygenic scores and so on. But um, as it turns out, a previously proposed hypothesis that has been very popular over the decades uh, is that the mechanism of the GRT relationship 
uh, actually would represent global nerve conduction speed in the brain, as would be um, evidenced by, uh, by myelin on neurons. But um, if this were the case, we would expect to see that G is actually correlated equally with all stages of processing, instead of being chiefly represented in one stage. So this is actually consistent with um, some of the results from the third years of education GWAS, which found no evidence for gene sets defined by uh, myelination or, um, or expression in oligodendrocytes. So this um, kind of provides an excellent springboard for possible future research because little is known about um, the direct causal link between genetic variants and information processing as it is measured in these kinds of simple reaction time tasks. So this study is currently under review at the Journal of Experimental Psychology, Learning Memory and Cognition, and the public code and data is available on OSF as well. All right, so uh, the third study included in uh, my dissertation is called the heritability of intelligence estimated in biological and adoptive families with 30 year old offspring. So for some background, adoption studies have long been considered a gold standard in, in assessing the extent to which IQ is affected by the family environment. Um, various early adoption studies found that children's IQs only correlated with those of their adopted parents early in childhood. And by adolescence, this relationship often uh, had petered out almost to zero. So for example, uh, Scar and Weinberg's uh, famous series of adoption studies in the 70s and 80s basically found um, very little parent offspring correspondence uh, at the end of the, of the rearing period. Other adoption studies have found very similar things such as John Lowland's Texas Adoption Project that, um, that also seem to show that IQ, the, the heritability of IQ changes quite substantially over the course of development. So at original testing, um, they, they basically, the adoptive uh, relationships showed uh, some modest correlations with, between parent and offspring IQ and between adoptive offspring, I mean adoptive siblings, sorry. Uh, but at a 10 year follow-up, all of these uh, had declined. If we compare um, the way that the adoptive mother offspring correlation changes to the biological mother offspring uh, correlation, we see quite a substantial difference where uh, biological pairs correspondence increases in all cases across time. Um, so even though many adoption studies of this time found that uh, these environmental effects on IQ uh, peter out in adolescence, other studies have still found a significant, a significant effect of adoption on um, IQ, but um, these have only been conducted up to the end of the rearing period at about 18 years old, such as uh, Kenler et al. Uh, 2015. Mm, so it's, it's pretty much remained unknown uh, whether this effect would persist beyond the end of the rearing period up through um, you know, middle adulthood, basically in adoptive offspring. And uh, little is also known about if this is happening, what envir environmental mechanisms would explain it. So this study represents the first adoption study of IQ in a fully adult sample that is long past the rearing period. Uh, so our unique sample here um, consists of both adoptive and biological families that were measured in IQ once in childhood um, around the age 15, and then again in adulthood. Now they average age 32. So um, we can ask with this unique sample, in both types of offspring, how have the heritability and parental environment influence on IQ changed over this period of about 17 years? And also, um, if so, do polygenic scores reveal evidence of genetic nurture in adulthood uh, with the same methods that we used in study one? So um, to estimate variance components, including heritability, we adapted uh, Keller et al. 2009's cascade model to include adoptive relationships. And um, our sample here consisted of uh, over 600 families that participated in the intake phase when they were first assessed, 
This included about 400 adoptive and 200 non-adoptive families. And the average age of placement in adoptive homes was very young. So these adoptive children basically um, experienced the majority of their development with their adoptive parents. Sample breakdown basically looks like this. Number of individuals um, varied a little bit. Mean age at intake for adoptive and biological offspring is very similar, about 15 years old. And then uh, all were about 32 years old at follow-up too. So to just quickly get into the results here, um, at intake, we had data from a variety of IQ subtests. And um, we'll mostly just be focusing on G for, for, for this. So, um, but across all of the IQ measures and subtests, we do see fairly strong correspondence between parent offspring uh, and siblings. Uh, picture completion is a bit strange. Um, note also that vocabulary uh, is one of the strongest um, of all of the biological uh, pair correlations. Okay, so this was intake. Um, now at follow-up three, offspring mean age 32, um, our measure of G is now the ICAR-16. And unfortunately, we only have vocab the voc vocabulary subtest in follow-up three, um, which as it turns out is a bit of a puzzle and in interpretation. But we can see that for G, in all cases of adopted relationships, the correlation has diminished from what it was in childhood, consistent with uh, the initial predictions from Scar and Weinberg and so on. And so in, um, in follow-up three, ICAR uh, 16 scores for both mom and dad correlate similarly for biological and adoptive families. And we can see it's almost flat uh, for adoptive families. So our variance decomposition shows us how much variance in each IQ measure is due to genetics, um, parental and sibling environment gene environment covariance and non-shared environment. Uh, so I know there are a lot of numbers in this table, but we'll focus mostly just on comparing these at time one and time two are different measures of G. And what we can see here is that the heritability has increased and all um, measures that include uh, the shared environment, so parental environment, sibling environment, and GE covariance have all diminished as well. So again, this is quite, um, quite in line with what we would predict uh, given previous research on this topic. Uh, note also that vocabulary in time two is very, or time three is very strange. Um, there seems to be some effect of the parenting environment and some GE covariance, but um, this could be due for a variety of reasons, including uh, just measurement error and, and so on. So um, just to, to recast that big table of numbers into a nice little bar graph, um, we basically see that there is a strong genetic effect that persists on G over time with little evidence for the shared environment. And that vocabulary scores are kind of equivocal and difficult to interpret. So another thing that we can do with this sample, since they are all genotyped, is uh, we can use their polygenic scores to predict uh, different measures of IQ. And um, as it turns out, the prediction for polygenic score on verbal IQ is actually, uh, to our knowledge, the, the strongest prediction of, um, of any study to date. Um, and the, the prediction for total IQ is pretty good too. Uh, but perhaps more interestingly, we can also use polygenic scores um, in this adoptive sample to test for a placement effect in adoption, which is a common criticism of adopted adoption studies. Um, but as we can see, the, um, the mid-parent PGS is correlated with biological PGS at almost exactly what you would expect at about 0.66. Um, while the correlation between uh, parent and offspring PGS in adoptive families is not significantly different from zero. And this is the case for both um, white adopted offspring and Asian adopted offspring. Uh, so we can look at uh, polygenic scores for through one last lens here. 
um, through a, a bar plot showing uh, basically the effects of genetic nurture or something similar that would be operating in adoptive families. Um, so in white biological families, we see no evidence of genetic nurture for any IQ phenotype, um, at least at the threshold of P is less than 0.01. Um, we also failed to detect any genetic nurture acting on those tests that have um, the strongest biometrical evidence of parenting effects. So uh, vocabulary, it intake, so on. Um, and uh, lastly, surprisingly, we also detected no genetic nurture even for years of education, despite um, earlier findings of, of us and also other researchers. Um, but in this case, the sample of biological families was, was much smaller. Uh, so our uh, ability to, um, our, our power to detect this kind of correlation is, is kind of diminished for that reason. But in any case, um, for our conclusions, um, with a unique sample of uh, now adult biological and adoptive families, we fail to find any evidence for a, a persistent effect of parenting on general intelligence. Um, we use polygenic scores to test for the presence of genetic nurture and we could not identify any unique effect of parents polygenic sp score on offspring IQ, uh, either in childhood or adulthood. Um, and again, the, the effects uh, of vocabulary are kind of equivocal. We don't really have a good explanation for what's going on with that. But um, yep, we also found no evidence for a placement effect in adoption. And so this study is ready to be submitted to intelligence and uh, pre-registration and public data will, are available also at OSF. Okay. So um, just to end with a couple of uh, quick general conclusions from these three studies and what they imply about the nature of intelligence. Um, to recap, study one investigates uh, whether genetic nurture can be detected in a sample of uh, monozygotic and dizygotic twins. We find um, almost 2% incremental variance added by the parent's polygenic score. Uh, study two explores the mechanistic expression of intelligence with reaction time laboratory study. And we use the method of additive factors and diffusion modeling to provide converging lines of evidence for a unique role of G in the central stage of information processing. Study three uses a highly unique sample of adult adoptive families uh, to test for a persistent effect of the parenting environment on adulthood IQ. And um, both biometric modeling and tests of genetic nurture find no evidence in support of a strong role of the parenting environment on adulthood G. And so, um, in sum, a useful understanding of human intelligence requires, I think, a diversity of approaches um, to provide various types of insight and evidence for causality. We can look down on human intelligence as well as look up from it. And each of these three studies capitalizes on some distinct aspect of, um, of technology or design including uh, genomide association, uh, reaction time paradigms from cognitive psychology, and the utility of adoption and persistence of follow-up in our adoption sample. And so um, I'll end on this note. Um, these, these effects like genetic nurture are certainly fascinating, but um, the, the research in this area certainly implies that when it comes to human intelligence, the vast majority of known variants originates from the genetic substrate that has uh, been endowed to us through millions of years of natural selection. Um, we now have a kind of unprecedented view into the function of gene products as they operate in uh, the generation of neurons and synaptic communication, but little is known about their direct causal link to how information processing actually happens in the brain. Um, so I believe that um, a future program of research that sort of turns its lens towards IQ um, at this level of focus at understanding the link between genetic variants and things like basic processing of information um, and specific abilities such as math abilities will be um, among the most lucrative 
um, <clears throat> and, and fruitful in future research. Okay, on that note, I'd like to thank everybody who um, has helped me over the years, especially my committee and my excellent advisors, um, and to everyone else who has supported me in this research. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. So now we have a few minutes for questions from the public. And I think we're safe to just unmute and fire away. All right, well, I have a question uh, for you, Emily. First of all, let me say uh, congratulations. It's a really impressive body of work that you've presented and really nice to see that all come to fruition. Um, I have a question that's, it's, I guess, a methodological issue, and it's something that we've been wrestling with uh, in one of my projects. And uh, it has to do with using polygenic scores. Anytime you're using polygenic scores as a control variable, as in the genetic nurture kind of research. Now, so the polygenic scores are certainly not yet capturing all of the uh, heritable variants in the things that they're being estimated for, right? So we're up to what, about 10% uh, of the variance in IQ uh, or in educational attain attainment a little bit more. And so I guess the, the challenge is if you're using it as a control variable and you find incremental prediction from some other variable, how do you know that it's not just because you're inadequately controlling for the heritable variance in the first place because the polygenic scores aren't good enough yet? Well, um, yeah, that's that's definitely a good point. And you know, one answer to that is that um, every new GWAS of educational attainment is going to um, have a much bigger sample and we'll have much better polygenic scores and so on as we find more rare variants and stuff. But um, I think personally, when you're draw, trying to draw causal inference using polygenic scores as a control, um, it's important to look at other converging lines of supporting evidence as well. So in, um, in, in the first study in molecular psychiatry, um, it isn't just the, the incremental significant effect of the parent's PGS, but it's the fact that that's consistent with the covariate analysis where um, you know, family SES especially seems to completely obliterate the effect of parent's PGS, as well as the simultaneous um, within twinship uh, attenuation of the um, of the polygenic score. So those three kind of lines of converging evidence all seem to support that um, there really is a legitimate, um, there's some sort of legitimate genetic nurture that's going on in that case. But I've also, um, I recently read people talking about how our estimates of genetic nurture are probably a little bit inflated anyway. And so to that end, um, yeah, I, I agree with your concerns. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, we are running a, just a little bit behind, and I, I hate to do this, but perhaps we could do a, one more question from the public. There must be one more. I mean, I'm like Matt, I always have a question. Emily, what study, if you had the funding, would you, where would you go next? Um. I would love to look at uh, this question of, of what, what are the gene products um, that we know from things like EA3 actually doing that causes faster reaction time or better information processing or um, you know what, what, are, what are the specific functions that link those genes and their gene products to the expression of intelligence in the real world? I think, I think that area is totally fascinating. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. Uh, okay. Well, uh, oh, go ahead. Somebody going to speak? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Emily. Uh, this is Brad Hodson, and uh, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions for you that are perhaps uh, a bit nominal. Uh, when you when you started out, you said that your uh, uh, sample was coming from a European ancestry. Mm -hmm. 
uh, although you entered it in an Asian, Asian <clears throat> um, component towards the end, I think, of the second uh, module. And uh, did you include any other racial differences at all in your, um, in your study? No, uh, the, the GWAS data all comes from European participants to avoid issues of population stratification and so on. And um, we do have some adoptees that with known races other than uh, white and Asian, but um, the majority of the adoption sample is East Asian. So those are the only uh, ethnic groups that we looked at other than Europeans. In the last couple of days, I've, I've read or listened to uh, a couple of articles and videos, and uh, one of them, uh, I think, appeared in the uh, New York Times the other day, and it was talking about a fellow who is uh, being put to death. He's in death row in, I believe it was Indiana, or I may have that wrong. But did his mm, uh, IQ uh, caused him to be looked at in part by as being uh, disabled developmentally at an IQ measurement of about 77. And he's done several, te several tests that have been uh, given to him at different times. Uh, and, but his IQ has stayed relatively the same on all of those tests. And the concern was that 77 as an IQ score wasn't considered to be developmentally uh, disabled from the standpoint of the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court has indicated that an, an IQ of 75 or less would be considered to be developmentally disabled, and this fellow had about a 77. And my question would be, has over time, over the period of time that you measured, uh, has the median IQ score increased as people as people have aged or decreased as they've aged? Um, that, that, that's probably not a very clear question, but. I, I don't think I've really looked at that question specifically in my own data, but um, I, I do know that in, in large cohorts, when this question is looked at, um, it's typically some subtests of IQ that tend to change over time. Um, so the, the, I think abstract reasoning tends to decline um, while um, verbal ability does not seem to decline comparably in, into age uh, like that at all. Um, as for overall just full IQ scores, um, there'd be an issue with separating age-related decline and um, possibility of the Flynn effect, at least over generations. And um, outside of dementia and Alzheimer's and, and other such things, I'm not really aware of, um, of there being any known mechanism for which IQ declines naturally over the course of the life, substantially at least. Uh, just a, a couple follow-ups to that. Uh, I was listening to a, just a, a partial, partial uh, part of a show the other day, <clears throat> and they were talking about the uh, the computer game Tetris. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. It's been around for 30 years or more. Uh, I wasn't very familiar with it, but it said that <clears throat> Tetris has been examined and that you can influence an, a person's IQ score by the amount of Tetris they play. And also uh, they can mitigate, in some cases, PTSD by using you know, someone that's playing Tetris a lot. Did you uh, have any idea of uh, uh, the effect on IQ uh, that would be uh, uh, would be apparent from playing games, computer games? Yeah, um, I've seen the research about Tetris increasing IQ and I'm, I'm agnostic but skeptical about whether those effects would persist over time. And if they do, I imagine they would be very small. Um, I, I do also know that, that there have been many studies showing that Tetris diminishes the effects of 
traumatic memories, I think um, mostly because the visual uh, engagement and attention that one invests into Tetris is, um, is able to kind of replace, uh, you know, the limited capacity for uh, visual memories. And so traumatic memories that are visual in nature can be um, kind of diminished by that occupation of uh, visual working memory by Tetris. But... Uh, I, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. I think at, at this point, we do need to close the public session. I'm, I'm very sorry, the, the committee needs to now take a crack at asking Emily some questions and uh, we'll need some time to do that. So I think if people could join me, I, I don't know if you can unmute or not, but just another round of applause maybe for Emily uh, and then we'll close the session. All right, we do our best. Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, it was really a wonderful turnout. So we'll, we'll close the session now and we'll move to the private uh, questioning. And Darren, can you help with that? Thank you.